Malta is not offshore. Offshore does not exist here. Malta is very onshore. Unanimously, it would boil down to one thing. Here, we get this sense of a culture of getting things done. If you're, if you're not in the top tier, um, if you're the 10th largest or the 20th largest, and you're a little bit more cost conscious, I think Malta offers a great deal of value. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Executive Spotlight, where I, as chairman of the Malta Stock Exchange, talk to leaders here in Malta regarding um, regarding Maltese industry and Maltese uh, fund management business and capital markets, etc. Today, I'm very happy to uh, advise that we've got a dear friend, an old friend, a gentleman named Andre Zarafa, managing partner from Ganado Advocates. Welcome, Andre. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Thanks for having us here. Um, and um, it's uh, it's a pleasure to see such initiatives being taken by the exchange. I think that uh, more of these types of initiatives need to be taken because of the um, outreach which an initiative such as this would have with the international community. Agreed. Thank you. That's the reason why we're doing them. So, Andre, before we begin, um, we do we will have people from all over the world potentially watching this video. So let's start by you telling us who uh, Ganado Advocates are. Tell us a bit about Ganado, about their history, and about yourself. Thank you, Joe. So uh, Ganado Advocates is a full-service law firm, uh, meaning that we, we span all areas of commercial law. Uh, we focus on laws and regulations in the commercial field, in corporate, uh, in financial services, and traditionally, and this is how the firm started, we are a maritime law firm as well. Mm -hmm. So in the uh, beginning of the 1980s, uh, when the firm took shape, it started off as a shipping firm. It then moved into financial services in the mid-90s when Malta at the time had issued a set of legislation spanning all areas of financial services, be it insurance, banking and investment services. And at the time, a group of lawyers within the firm had decided to focus on financial services as one of the um, key targets even set at the time by the Minister for Finance um, for Malta to progress as a, as a, a key, key development, a, a key area um, in the development of the country. Once Malta joined the European Union in 2004, the firm grew exponentially. Uh, it grew exponentially in, in a number of different areas. Uh, today, we're over 100 lawyers uh, and regulatory advisors within, within the firm. We also have a corporate service provider and a trustee which are affiliated to the firm and the, the, the whole scope of the firm is to basically enable, enable a client to approach us and we would be able to service that client from, uh, in, all, in all their needs insofar as uh, commercial law uh, is concerned. And by the way, for those watching um, who aren't aware of this, Malta has one of the world's largest shipping registries, correct? That's right. I believe at this point, Malta is the biggest uh, ship registry in the EU, mm -hmm. and it must rank uh, in the top 10 right. uh, in the world. Right, right, indeed. Now, let's talk about Malta's financial industry. Uh, Malta does have a fledgling financial industry. We're not exactly London, Luxembourg, uh, or Ireland, uh, but we do have a fund management industry. Uh, we have a international insurance industry, and of course, we have a capital markets industry, which pretty much services the local capital markets. So let's talk about the fund management space first. Okay. Tell us a bit about where we were and where we are now and where you think the industry is going. Okay. Um, I think, well, looking back, when I was still doing uh, legal practice at, at Ganado in the 90s, we had a very um, a local local community of, of asset managers, uh, portfolio managers, wealth managers, which were servicing the local markets. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be um, uh, the, 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 the bigger names at the time dominated by the banks. Mm -hmm. Okay, with each, each bank had at the time its own asset manager. Uh, and until we joined the European Union, that was again, as I was saying, 2004, it practically remained, remained um, uh, in, the, in, that, in, in, that, in that form, in that shape. Uh, the entry into the European Union gave us the opportunity to, first of all, 
we could open up the market to use its funds uh, and these even use its management companies. Mm-hmm. I must say that the our success in the USS area wasn't great because at the time we already had other jurisdictions in the EU which had been in the USS area for for more than a decade. Mm-hmm. Uh, so our entry point was was quite late in the day. Uh, not to mention that our banking infrastructure wasn't to to a level expected from a USS manager. At the same time, in parallel, we saw the growth in Malta, uh, which keeps on happening till today, of the alternative asset management uh, mm-hmm. space. In alternative asset management, I think Malta has registered significant success. Today, we are uh, hitting the 70 asset managers licensed mm-hmm. in Malta, uh, which compares very well even with the more established maybe jurisdictions in the European Union. The, uh, the growth of the asset management community I would, if I were to pick a, a year, I believe started in 2007, mm-hmm. kept on growing, year on year, um, uh, hit, it was hit by the financial crisis, especially mm-hmm. in 2009 and 2010, like any other asset management community in the world was hit at the time. So we had a few winding ups and shutdowns happening in 2011 and 2012, we started recovering again in 2013, 2014. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, the asset management community moved from being practically dominated entirely by an Anglo-Saxon community of hedge fund managers. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I, I would specify hedge fund managers. So uh, I remember in uh, in 2007 on to maybe even till 2013, mm-hmm. there were very few other types of managers managing other types of funds mm-hmm. which were established in Malta. It was hedge funds primarily. Right. And by the way, right around 2007 and 2008, actually, I got my first job with a fund of funds. Uh, yeah. you, you recall who they are. And they were quite large. They had $2 billion assets. Um, but roughly around 2007, 2008, we had about a half a dozen fund managers that had AU1 north of about a billion. Correct. A billion, that's right. a billion dollars. Yeah. So uh, because very often Malta uh, is associated with small emerging managers. Yeah. Um, but early on, we had some 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 managers that um, weren't emerging. I mean, they they were legacy managers. They'd been around for a while. Yes, and I think while a number of managers have left the island, not uh, because of any particular reason linked to the island, but because of financial circumstances, sometimes performance even, performance yeah. uh, was quite a killer, yeah. especially for the funds of funds and the hedge funds during the financial crisis and immediately after the. Uh, at the end of it, we still today have a number of our uh, asset management firms which are managing north of two billion, uh, mm-hmm. two billion euro. So uh, the 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 growth of the asset management community in Malta was not the same and was much faster, I think, and much more focused than the growth of the fund domiciliation uh, structures. So funds being domiciled in Malta and obtaining a license from the MFSA or basically going on the list of MFSA approved um, uh, collective investment schemes, where the the growth was slower mm-hmm. than that of the asset management community. And uh, I believe that the main reason for the this difference is that first of all, we as a, as a jurisdiction have given the asset management community um, a number of personal tax incentives apart from the corporate tax, but the corporate tax applies to everyone in Malta, mm-hmm. not specifically to the asset management community. Um, but there were a number of uh, personal uh, tax incentives emerging from what we refer to as the highly qualified person scheme, mm-hmm. which attracted talent to Malta to set up a business in Malta with substance in Malta. Right. Whereas with a fund, you can't really do that. I mean, a fund is a structure and the highly qualified person regime does not yeah, apply. And by the way, that scheme pretty much meant that if you were relatively senior, um, you would be able to come to Malta, work here in Malta, um, and be taxed at a flat 15% tax rate. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Capped at 5 million. Yeah. So about 5 million, yeah. you wouldn't be taxed yeah. at all. Right. Um, which, which sounds very aggressive from a, from a tax perspective. But here, when one refers to personal income tax, mm-hmm. uh, there is really each member state of the European Union is sovereign and there isn't uh, uh, some expectation of some tax harmonization um, uh, or, or some tax equality, let's say. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we pay more being resident in Malta, right. but the whole reason for 
uh, these schemes was to attract talents to Malta mm-hmm. in order for this talent then to train people in Malta and build an ecosystem right. in the asset management yeah. community. Um, let's talk about what brought these fund managers to Malta in the first place. Um, I, I think one, someone might suggest that there was a, f- a positive fiscal element to it, but I, I, I think that wasn't the sole reason. I think perhaps the sole reason was that um, in 2008, 2009, Malta was considered a relatively low cost jurisdiction for fund managers, particularly for small fund managers. And um, for those people in the industry, uh, they know that there are three letters that fund managers, particularly small fund managers, are very cognizant of. And those three letters are TER, total expense ratio. And it's definitely in the interests of smaller fund managers. When I say smaller managers, managers managing as low as 5 million, 10 million, 20, 50 million. Today, by the way, even a couple of hundred million is considered small because the big fund managers have yeah. become so much bigger. I mean, managing tens of billions as opposed to just billions. Um, but I, I, I think what attracted fund managers to Malta was one, it was a relatively low cost jurisdiction. So you can set up, you can hire a slate of board members, investment committee members, compliance officers, anti money laundering officers for a relatively affordable cost, yep. right? Um, there was also the regulator, um, which at the time was considered quite approachable, and I think they are approachable today also. Um, I've dealt with the regulators since 2008. I think they're highly professional, very competent. Another reason why fund managers came to Malta was dealing with service providers like yourself. We have the Big Ten are all here in Malta. The Big Four, Big Five are here in Malta. They're very capable. Um, and the fact of the matter that we speak English. And by the way, Malta isn't necessarily an awful place to live. It's actually a lovely place to live. We've got great weather. Uh, and I joke around with my friends in Dublin uh, and I tell them, I say, well, you guys might have more um, um, more uh, technical listings than we do and you might have more funds listed on your exchange than we do, but at least we have a hell of a lot nicer weather than you guys have. So what would you say is the totality of the package? Why would fund managers set up in Malta? I think it was, if I were to pin it down to one thing, and I remember a number of clients coming here, uh, because a client can be given brochures, we can have long conference calls, and uh, they can be given a list of tax incentives that they could be subject to. Mm -hmm. We can say a lot of things about um, how MFSA is pragmatic but robust, and we have a good legal framework, etc., etc. And we can go on and on over these mm-hmm. these conference calls uh, to explain how good we are. However, it was always uh, uh, one of the most important things for a fund manager was to come here and see for himself and touch uh, the jurisdiction, meet the right people in Malta. And um, I can't remember a single case where at the end of all these meetings that our clients would have here with a number of service providers with the regulator, where they would say, well, you know, I don't like the way in which you're dealing with uh, with situations. I don't like the way in which you are uh, portraying yourselves. Mm-hmm. Unanimously, it would boil down to one thing. Here, we get this sense of a culture of getting things done. So when we are approaching and speaking to people in Malta, we get uh, um, the comfort that you're not just saying it, mm-hmm. but you're gonna do it. Right. And I think this is very, very important. Uh, And this is also important because of the number of years that we have gone through over the last six to seven years where our focus was nearly entirely on governance, risk and compliance, Mm -hmm. where we might have lost that sense of getting the things done, this culture of getting things done. Because when you are in a situation where governance, risk and compliance reign supreme, Mm -hmm. then anything else becomes secondary. So rather than thinking on solutions, you're actually thinking on risks first. Right. I'm not saying that it is necessarily a bad thing, but the two need to coexist. Yeah. They need to move together. Yeah. And and by the way, I think it's important to say that um, you should not come to Malta if you're looking for light touch regulation. The MFSA is, why is MFSA, the Malta Financial Services Authority, um, they take uh, regulation very, very seriously. Um, and I, I think... Uh, there's no way to sugarcoat this. Um, we are highly regulated. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the all the European Union directives apply in Malta. Mm-hmm. Some of them even have direct effects. So even if mm-hmm. we were to ignore uh, the day, which we don't, because I think we're statistically 
one of the, the we're, we're top three, I believe, countries in the European Union which implement and transpose EU legislation quickest mm -hmm. of all the European Union members. Um, at the same time, there is the full set of, of rules which apply in Malta. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we do have structures uh, in Malta which, although subject to some form of regulation or notification, are not as heavily regulated mm -hmm. as, I would say, for example, a USIS fund or a USIS fund manager uh, in recognition of the fact, acknowledging the fact that regulation has to be proportionate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is one of the uh, main missions, main objectives of the MFSA, which the MFSA keeps on repeating until yesterday we had a client focus event and the MFSA, the CEO of MFSA was invited for this event and he did um, make it very clear while uh, regulation is there, is there to stay and will increase. Mm -hmm. Okay, the latest increases we're seeing with DORA, okay, SFDR, CSRD, I mean, all these new directives coming through, hitting you from all over the place. Mm -hmm. At the same time, regulation needs to be proportionate. Yep. And being the smallest country in the yep. European Union, we are even more uh, sensitive Absolutely, to the, the, yeah. the principle of proportion. And, and by the way, whenever I have discussions with the regulator, um, I, I also push that agenda that please understand the proper proportionality element. You can't treat the multi stock exchange the same way you treat the London Stock Exchange. Absolutely. You can't treat a manager managing 20 uh, million same way you treat Renaissance Technologies or Brevin Howard managing tens and tens of billions. We just don't have the same resource. One of my fears, um, and, and I think this is legitimate, um, what, what I think is happening here in Euroland is we're creating a barrier to entry where we are almost discouraging small emerging market, I'm sorry, small emerging talent from opening funds. Because, I, I mean, I worked on Wall Street and I worked for a company called Commodity Corporation, which was bought up by Goldman Sachs. And that was an incubator for a lot of some of the world's biggest hedge funds, Paul Tudor Jones and, and Michael Marcus and, and Bruce Kovner and all those. And in those days, you could actually manage a fund. You could be a legitimate money manager with a million in assets. A million in assets made you a legitimate money manager. Today, some people say the number is 100 million. Some people say the number is 500 million um, because the costs of getting into the space. And I think it's fair to say that here in Euroland, the degree of, of um, governance infrastructure is significantly greater than what you'd see in the U.S. That's right. I mean, the, the, the well, regulation in the, in the U.S. is, I would say, um, nearly completely different, um, even strategically as an approach, mm -hmm. than regulation in the EU. Um, uh, uh, I was, I had, and recently, I was um, following this, 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 this seminar. And one of the speakers came up with a with a with a sound bite with a saying, uh, which he had heard from somebody else, where which which says that well the U.S. creates, China copies, the EU regulates. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think this has well, happened. That's well put. Yeah, uh, this has happened. I think in our community as well. So in 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 asset management, and in the financial markets, and practically in every financial service that you can imagine, the level of regulation. Uh, which, let's not forget, where does regulation, what is the, the mantra for regulation in the European Union? It is supposed to be consumer protection. Yeah. The reality, though, is that we've moved to a situation where the consumer has to pay much more mm -hmm. for the services that he's getting than he would have paid maybe when he was protected much less. No, absolutely. You're absolutely right, yeah. Uh, and there isn't much of a distinction, and we're seeing directives which are practically not distinguishing between retail and professional. Yeah. Let's go to um, three other letters, Capital Markets Union, CMU. Where are we with the CMU and why can't we get the CMU uh, in place? I think the CMU has been overall a failure. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, in the, my personal opinion, I think has, hasn't achieved the objectives for which it, it was conceived initially because... And this is a phenomenon which I see in regulators. Uh, you want to go one way, but while on your journey, you realize that you have to take certain courageous decisions. Uh, uh, uh. Once you get to it, and you mm -hmm. actually have to take those courageous de decisions, you get second thoughts. And rather than going on your way and knowing well enough that you're taking certain risks, okay, because that was the strategy in the first place, 
So opening up to the retail markets was one of the objectives of the Capital Markets Union. But if each member state or a number of member states, as soon as they see initiatives where they would where where a market is going to open up to the retail consumer, suddenly get second thoughts and suddenly come up with objections. Mm-hmm. They might go to the uh, European supervisory authorities to object. They might go to their own regulators to object um, because uh, the the of their concern that the that the retail consumer might be prejudiced because of certain products which might be launched out there, which was all supposedly agreed. Mm-hmm. Then you start backtracking. Mm-hmm. Then new rules come out, and suddenly, rather than moving forward, we start moving backwards. Right. Um, so. It's not- and I, I suspect, unfortunately, that we're going to see this happening quite soon in spite of Mika and in spite of all the rules and regulations which are coming out even in the world of uh, virtual financial assets. Mm-hmm. So whereas we give the impression, we, whereas the European Union, institutions within the European Union, give the impression on the one hand that they would like the um, virtual virtual financial classes to also be available to retail consumers with loads of checking and loads of regulation, of course, mm-hmm. as it should be. On the other hand, in spite of all the regulation, I suspect that a number of different uh, approaches are going to be taken by the different member states in order to stop retail consumers from investing in virtual financial assets. Understood. And this is the most recent phenomenon. Okay, we'll get to digital assets in a few minutes. Uh, but I, I agree with you. I, I regret very much that the CMU um, is is just really hasn't gone anywhere because I think the concept makes a great deal of sense having one pan capital markets where a multi citizen can easily buy Polish equities and vice versa. But but I don't think we're there yet. Um, AIFMD two, okay, and the custody situation. Where are we there? That I mean the way in which the AIFMD has now. Um, being rehashed into AFM the two should allow funds in different member states subject to certain again certain parameters certain mm-hmm. rules and subject to acceptance mm-hmm. by their local regulator to appoint depositories in other member states so mm-hmm. today the rule is that if you are domiciling your alternative investment fund in for example Malta then that AIF needs to appoint a depository, which is also domiciled in Malta. Yeah, and um, uh, let's get this out. Uh, a lot of people in Malta were very disappointed with the initial AIFMD rule, which required the custodian and the fund to be in the same domicile. Yes. Okay. And a lot of us looked at that as being very anti-EU trade. No. Yeah. Because the whole concept behind the EU is cross-border trading. And and I think that's one reason why, regrettably, our fund management industry didn't blossom into something bigger and better because in 2010, 12, although we started out with a number of larger custodians, um, eventually they closed down because the business wasn't there and it was the uh, proverbial chicken and egg yes. situation. So we couldn't get more um, larger fund managers because we didn't have larger custodians. Today here in Malta, there are roughly six or seven custodians, correct? I believe there are seven. Okay. Uh, but the fact that AIFMD now should theoretically allow a Maltese fund to utilize a custodian in Ireland or Luxembourg will, I think, potentially help grow the industry. Yes, it would potentially help grow the industry. What is more important, I think, is that it would give more choice to investors, institutional investors in particular, Mm -hmm. and more choice to fund managers. Because as things stand today, you are restricted if you decide to choose any domicile in the European Union. This is with AIFMD as it is today, mm-hmm. then you, as you were saying, Joe, you have to you have to appoint a depository in the same jurisdiction. Even if you don't like any of the depositors in that jurisdiction, you're forced to appoint one of them. Right. Otherwise, change domicile of your fund. Right. Domicile it somewhere else, which is a little bit counterintuitive. It doesn't make much sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Especially in a market which is a, a professional investor market, had it been a retail market, I can perhaps concede I can perhaps imagine a situation where you'd want to, the depository to be in the same jurisdiction, in the same domicile as the fund, because there you have consumer protection is the as at the top of the of your objectives, at the top of your targets, and you just need to make sure that if you're if the fund is domiciled in your country, you need to also grab in the depository 
and you can only do that effectively if it is also domiciled. Indeed, with, with all due respect to the smaller depositories, if I'm a calipers or if I'm a huge institutional investor and I'm investing with XYZ fund as a due diligence, well, when I do my due diligence, I want to know who the custodian is. Absolutely. And um, I want to deal with a household name institutional custodian, Boney Mellon, for example. It just, it's just the, the way it works, yeah. I'm afraid. Um, and, and the same thing with fund administrators. Very often they want to deal with the CITGOs, the larger, more institutional fund administrators. Yes. Um, so that's why it's important that we have this cross-border uh, uh, that's it, That will be allowed. Mm -hmm. Now, with, within limits, there are certain parameters which need to be respected. Uh, it is also up to the member state to allow it in the, in the case of Malta. I don't think it's a big secret that the MFSA is going to allow it. So it's going to allow a fund manager domiciling its fund in Malta to appoint a depository in another EU member state. So there's, there's no issue there. Um, I still think that as a jurisdiction, the focus needs to be um, more on, on, on certain types of niche markets. Mm -hmm. There are a number of different opportunities out there. Um, there are so many subsets of different strategies and different fund managers, which, which are sprouting all over the place mm -hmm. that really, I think the domicile, uh, the jurisdiction needs to pick those niches, those groupings mm -hmm. of fund managers, which, uh, it wishes to attract to Malta, mm -hmm. which are clean, which have, uh, investment strategies, which make sense. Um, uh, which, which are also, uh, nothing is future proof, but which are quasi, let's say mm -hmm. future proof in order to attract them to Malta and to build an ecosystem around them. Okay. Um, we're just about done. Um, so there are some people who are going to be watching this from perhaps the United States or China or Singapore. Um, and they're wondering whether they should set up a financial institution here in Malta, whether that's a fund management business, a digital asset business, an EMI business. Um, quickly give us three, two, three, four reasons why they should, but let's manage expectations also. What, if you do come Malta, where do you have to be patient in some respects? Okay, I think, well, insofar as why should anyone entertain even setting up something in Malta, I think Malta being a member of the European Union and also a member of the Eurozone, apart from the fact of its location where it is, which is practically in between Africa, Northern Africa and, and Europe, it provides a unique opportunity for anyone coming from outside of the European Union to have a base here in order both to tap into the European Union market, but even potentially be close to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. It is no secret that the Middle East is, 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 uh, uh, budding, it's, 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 uh, the success, mm -hmm. which, the, which is being registered there by a number of different Emirates and countries is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, as we always say, the fund managers need to follow the money at the sure. end of it. Well, everyone's going to Dubai, no? Yeah, that's right. Um, now Dubai is not in the European Union. So of course the level of rules and regulations would be different to the ones, uh, which one will find in Malta. And this brings me to, uh, the managing of expectations. Although uh, we are open for business, although I think the culture of getting things done is coming back, okay, because we did lose it for a few years, it is coming back and it is coming back strong. I still feel that because of the European Union directives and regulations, someone coming in from the outside needs to accept that there is a very, very robust mm -hmm. regulatory framework to which they would be subject. Absolutely. And they also have to accept yes. that no substance, no game. That's right. Okay, so this is, I think, one of the key points which we always discuss on these initial conference calls that we have. Now that, they became now point. they became Zoom yeah. or two Teams calls. Yeah, that's a great was. point. Malta is not offshore. Offshore does not exist here. Malta is very onshore, and um, it's very professional. Service providers are very professional. Everyone speaks in English, and the regulators are very serious professionals. Yeah. Okay, uh, but the good news is uh, they will deal with you. They'll listen to what you have to say. Right? That's right. Um, uh, and how about costs? How about setting up here in Malta? I think, the, 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 because that would be probably uh, the Euro, um, uh, the EU membership. The fact that there is an EU regulator which would be scrutinizing, which is open for business, probably number one. 
Mm-hmm. Number two, I wouldn't even put cost. Number two, I would put the, re- the legislative framework. Mm-hmm. So our legislation is in English mm-hmm. and the Maltese. The English version actually prevails over the Maltese version in the financial services laws. Okay, so there you have certainty of law where um, any operator coming in from the outside doesn't need to scratch his head and understand what the French version might say, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or what the German version might say of the law. Yeah, it's basically English. Okay, so be it company law, be it income tax, be it um, investment services, be it banking, uh, be it insurance, it is the English version which would prevail. Now, the the... So I think the, the legislative framework is also a hybrid system. So we're a hybrid civil and common law uh, system. We basically took the best of the two big, uh, biggest systems of law in the, in the world, which is common law or civil law. And we embedded them within our legislation um, with um, uh, all the, the, the typical structures which one would find anywhere in the world, be it limited partnerships, be it companies, be it public companies, whatever. You name it, we have it. Our legislative framework, I think, is top-notch. And that I would put as the second uh, most important advantage, especially for investors. Yep. No investor would want their fund to be in a jurisdiction where uh, the, the, the legislative framework is not up to speed. No, absolutely. Much mm-hmm. That is, I think, much more important than the costs. Absolutely. No, I agree with you, but let's be honest. I think the Black Rocks of the world aren't necessarily going to set up in Malta because they've got very deep pockets, they're very well financed. Yeah. Um, but I think what makes Malta attractive is there's a value proposition here. If you're if you're not in the top tier, um, if you're the tenth largest or the twentieth largest, and you're a little bit more cost conscious, I think Malta offers a great deal of value. Yes, I, I mean, number three, I would put the the uh, let's say competitiveness when it comes to, to, to the expense side, right? To the, the cost competitiveness. Right. Malta tends to be um, uh, around, I would say, 25 to 30% less expensive. So mm-hmm. I hate the word, but cheaper, yeah. right? Then your mainstream jurisdictions um, or fund domiciles or asset management domiciles in, in the European Union. Yeah. Uh, and... For some bigger operators, it doesn't matter. But for other operators, yes, in more absolutely. mid-term, mid-tier, it does matter. It does it, matter. Yes, it, it, it does matter, especially because the way in which the um, uh, MFSA typically tackle new operators coming in is that they would be open to agreeing on a scale-up of a business, mm-hmm. on a scale-up of presence, on a scale-up of substance. So here, maybe as opposed to other jurisdictions, uh, a startup manager or someone who is uh, maybe has two or three years behind him of, of experience who wants to formalize their structure in a, in a domicile and wants to invest in that domicile wouldn't be required to have six, seven employees from day one. Right. They need to have substance and they need to have people. But there's a way and a way in which substance can be set up. You can set up with a couple of, of uh, portfolio managers mm-hmm. based in Malta. You can have your compliance officer here. I've heard in other jurisdictions, I've heard of situations where the regulators are one size fits all there's no proportionate approach and whether you're a startup manager with a strategy of course of dissuading the startup manager from setting up in that domicile Mm -hmm. because they would want that particular jurisdiction would want the bigger player right well the bigger player if i if i tell a black rock you need to start off with seven people they're gonna laugh at me they'd go i was thinking of 200 you know whereas for a startup or a smaller manager seven people is a huge expense bill ackman and David Harding, two of the most successful hedge fund managers of all time, started funds with a million dollars in assets. You can't do that today in a lot of jurisdictions. You can do it in Malta, though. You certainly can. Um, Andre, thank you very much. Andre Zarafa, managing partner from Ganado Advocates. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you.